Treaty One our King, Shagodash Menoa Nemigotu Yago Gue, we suck a tea and Niniak, Shagodash, we suck a tea, Quayok. So, welcome here to the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. We're very pleased that you guys could all uh, join us on uh, a night with some very Winnipeg weather uh, to discuss a, a very uh, Winnipeg issue. I was just talking to my friend Sheila Rogers uh, in from the West Coast here. She was remarking on the, uh, the energy that's here in this city right now, and I think it's true. You know, uh, here in Winnipeg, we are in the epicenter of something, whether you call that the indigenous resurgence or whether you call that uh, reconciliation in action. This city, as with so many other cities in this country, is really beginning to uh, grapple with what it means to be a contemporary uh, Canadian place that uh, is honest about what happened here and is uh, finding new ways to celebrate Indigenous culture and Indigenous peoples. So we've got some uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, things to get through here tonight. First, I want to acknowledge we're on uh, Treaty 1 territory. We also like to acknowledge the uh, seven Indigenous nations here in Manitoba, the Dakota, the Métis, the Dene, the Oji Cree, the Anishinaabeg, uh, the Cree and the Inuit. And of course we are in the homeland of the Métis Nation, Red River Settlement, where it all began. The place where the CMHR is located actually has a, uh, a history going back some 6,000 years. This has always been a meeting place for people of many different nations, you know, in the Early uh, history, it was a meeting place between the Anishinaabe and the Dakota, and then over the years, you know, other indigenous nations uh, came to meet here. And still to this day, it is the confluence, not only of two rivers, but also the confluence of uh, people from so many different walks of life who now call this place home. And yet in this country today, we are in a time of reconciliation, a time where the courage of the residential school survivors has uh, demanded that we step up and create a more just society. And now new generations of Canadians are beginning to understand what that means. But I'm excited about tonight's conversation because of the way it's framed. Reconciliation as innovation. And I think that um, if we were to think of reconciliation as merely a social justice project, or merely atoning for past wrongs, we would be missing out on some of the power of uh, what we are currently engaged in. Because make no mistakes about it, you know, indigenous people suffered in this country's history. But everyone else in this country was also deprived as well. Because for the past 150 years, you have lived in a, in a country, in a nation, where indigenous people have been prevented from reaching their full potential. And as a result, you've missed out on the vitality, the contributions to the public sphere, and the economic might that might have been realized had Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples been able to contribute to their full potential. So when I think about reconciliation in this country, not only do I, I think about uh, honoring people such as my late father, you know, who went to the residential school, who bore the brunt of that historic trauma, but I also think about my two sons and about uh, the tremendous uh, contributions they'll be able to make to the global pu public sphere, knowing that they are both proud Anishinaabe and also uh, happy to be Canadians here in this country. So why don't we get on with it? and figure out what this whole reconciliation as innovation project means. We're going to begin with uh, a greeting by video from His Excellency, the Governor General of Canada. Both in terms of world history and in the story of Canada, 
It's a time of profound globalization, of disruptive technologies, of major demographic shifts, of changing attitudes and expectations towards governments, institutions, and public services, of challenges to our environment, our energy supplies, and our health care. Ce que les pas pleines de pays et des possibilités pour les peuples autochtones au pays. Many of you will know that my wife Sharon and I had the great privilege and responsibility of being honorary witnesses to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And last spring, we hosted the ceremonial closing of the commission at Beulah Hall. Each of you understands that the future success of Canada depends on our ability to achieve reconciliation and to unlock the full potential of all members of our society. That's why I'm so pleased to know you are gathering in Winnipeg for this summit. It brings together two of our most important priorities, reconciliation and innovation. We can't have one without the other. And we simply can't afford to be complacent. And that means we all must find a forward path that is both collaborative and creative. Grâce à l'innovation, nous pouvons développer des tâches nouvelles et meilleures de faire les choses. Through innovation, we can develop new and better ways of doing things. We can create value, improve productivity, and meaningfully maintain and improve our quality of life. That's why we launched the Governor General's Innovation Awards to celebrate excellence and to inspire creativity, collaboration, risk-taking, and innovation from coast to coast to coast. And that, of course, includes in our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities. That's why you have come together at this very special event. So much is possible. Let me also say how pleased I am to know that you're honoring Justice Murray Sinclair this evening for his great work as chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Justice Sinclair, I salute you from Algonquin traditional territory here in Ottawa. All of your efforts are important in building a smarter, more caring Canada. Together, you're part of an emerging culture that sees innovation and reconciliation as inseparable. These are exciting, challenging times, and I thank and congratulate all of you on your dedication to creativity and to collaboration. Je vous félicite pour votre créativité et votre esprit de collaboration. Je vous souhaite un agréable semaine. Have a great summer. All right, well, we thank the Governor General for his words, and uh, he's right, you know. The uh, engagement of Indigenous nations and Indigenous cultures with the mainstream will uh, perhaps lead to the contribution of the wisdom and the insight of our uh, grandparents to the uh, challenges of our time, that we might unlock uh, some of the answers to climate change and uh, the global war on terror and income inequality by learning to better appreciate the wisdom of uh, so many Indigenous elders and Indigenous knowledge keepers. So we are in a time of transition, you know. His house was also home to a very inspiring uh, swearing-in ceremony that I uh, saw all over social media where we saw our friend uh, Thielen Kiknosue leading in the, uh, the Prime Minister with a hand drum. We saw the uh, Métis Jiggers and the Inuit uh, Throat Singers. And also we saw a Kwakwiak woman uh, sworn in to the post of Minister of Justice and uh, an Inuk Cabinet Minister, also named. So times are changing. And we saw that here in Winnipeg just over a year ago when a, a good friend of mine supported a, a lot of the uh, community uh, educational initiatives that we worked on at the University of Winnipeg in the past uh, assumed the highest office in City Hall. And I believe he's uh, the first uh, Indigenous mayor of a big city in Canada, member of the Métis Nation, a lawyer by trade, uh, Mayor Brian Bowman. And he's going to bring his greetings now. So please, uh, let's uh, give a warm welcome to his worship. Thank you very much and uh, good evening uh, everyone. Can I just ask, how many of you are from out of town? Just with a show of hands. Okay then, this is great. 
Welcome to Winnipeg. Welcome to Central Canada. And uh, welcome to, uh, as, uh, as WAB has already acknowledged, the uh, Treaty 1 land and of course the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. And uh, you are uh, very welcome here in Winnipeg. And what a wonderful location to have a gathering like this than at the first National Museum outside of, outside of the Ottawa capital region, this beautiful um, Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And I, I do hope you have an opportunity while you're in Winnipeg to, uh, to really see it and uh, uh, you know, take, take a look at the exhibits and, and soak in all that they have to offer. Um, I would like to, of course, recognize uh, Justice Murray Sinclair for uh, his tremendous contributions to our country. And of course, uh, Wab, thank you very much for a kind introduction. And of course, the distinguished panelists who we're all going to uh, benefit from listening to shortly. And, uh, and I want to thank all the volunteers and staff and contributors to helping make this Indigenous Innovation Summit uh, a reality. Uh, this is actually the same room where recently we held the, Indi the, um, the One Summit. And so this was, a, this was a direct response to the McLean's article that labeled Winnipeg the most racist city in the country. Not a tag that a new mayor really wants to have on a national magazine, but this community rose to the challenge and stepped up and said, we are not gonna just kill the messenger, we are going to actually address the issues, the horrible issues that were raised, and we're going to lead the nation in reconciliation, we're going to lead the nation in addressing some very painful truths and challenges that uh, Winnipeg and all Canadian cities, for that matter, have. Um, as you know, as, as all of you know, as well as anyone, uh, how important it is to explore ways to make reconciliation a reality in our great country. Uh, this requires us not to forget where we've come from, uh, at the same time, it requires us to look forward to new ways and uh, approaches regarding reconciliation. And we, we also know that we've not always lived up to our ideals of inclusion. Uh, our history is marred by terrible lapses, terrible failures, and this includes notably the treatment of our Indigenous peoples. Uh, the exclusion that Indigenous peoples have had to endure, and still endure to this day, is especially unconscionable. And the work done by the Honourable Mr. Justice Murray Sinclair and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was incredibly difficult and painful. The pain that the survivors endured, simply to tell their stories, was excruciating. And addressing the recommendations of the Commission is, in my view, going to be the biggest challenge that any of us do and face in our lifetimes. We can't be deterred, however, and it must begin with leadership from the community at large, including politicians. Too often, though, political leaders, in my view, have tried to address problems for our Indigenous peoples instead of with our Indigenous peoples. And we here in Winnipeg, and I believe across Canada, want to do better. We want to listen, we want to learn, and we want to keep moving forward. And the work and the dialogue being undertaken through this first Indigenous Innovation Summit will make an immense contribution to this effort. We're facing a tremendous challenge in Winnipeg, and really across Canada, to fight against exclusion, division, and fear and to find ways to really become more inclusive, more collaborative, and hopeful. And I do remain very hopeful. I'm hopeful because of the partnerships we've built and are being built in this very room tonight and continue to build across our country. I'm hopeful because of the commitment and the leadership provided by our Indigenous Advisory Circle at Winnipeg City Hall, led by Wab Canoe and joined by many other uh, outstanding community leaders, including Justice Sinclair, including the work uh, that's being undertaken by our Aboriginal Relations Division and our Citizens' Equity Committee. But most of all, I'm hopeful because of the positive response of our citizens, the desire that we truly have as a community to make things better. And it's genuine and it's very palpable. And I hope you feel it 
while you're here in Winnipeg. The TRC really, in my view, is and will be a turning point. If you're a TSN sports fan, it's the TSN turning point. Because it provides us with a roadmap, a roadmap that all of us can look to as a guide for how we move forward together, using innovation, of course. Uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has a committee which I'm a part of with the mayors of Saskatoon and Edmonton that will be working collaboratively to inspire action from the big city mayor's caucus. There's a lot of work that we have to do and we are going to be doing at Winnipeg City Hall and that's begun already. But the T TRC really provides the platform to turn from pain to the promise of a better future for us and our kids. And I mean us regardless of your background. Because as Wab eloquently mentioned at the beginning of his remarks, uh, we're all impacted by uh, the failings of our, 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 our country. The TRC also marks, I believe, the point where our collective paths can and will turn into one. That's why we called it the One Summit, because in order for our community to deal with very difficult and painful truths, you do need to be innovative, but you also need to work together. And, um, you know, in Winnipeg, it doesn't matter if you're from the North End, the South End, it doesn't matter if you're of Indigenous background, Ukrainian, Chinese heritage, Regardless of your background, you're a Winnipegger first and foremost, and you all have the right to expect to be treated with respect and have all the opportunities for you and for your, your kids that we all, we all want. Fundamental human values. I just want to say I'm really looking forward to hearing the panelists, so I'm going to stop talking. And I want to thank you for, for having me here tonight. I want you all to know also that the City of Winnipeg and I stand with you in this journey, a journey that will result in a better and a stronger Canada. I want to thank Justice Sinclair for all of your contributions. You're certainly worthy of the recognition and honour you're receiving tonight. I once heard something, I don't know who it, I can attribute this to, but when I was a teenager I heard a saying saying, I once felt sorry for a man who had no shoes until I met a man with no class. And you, sir, have a lot of class. I look at the work and the manner in which that you have served Canadians, all Canadians, um, as absolutely remarkable. And it makes me proud to be a member of the bar and to be a lawyer and uh, to be of Indigenous heritage, uh, to see the, the grace in which you've carried out your duties. And so we're very privileged to, uh, uh, to call you one of our own here and, uh, and, and to have you on our Indigenous Advisory Circle, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, you being honoured here tonight, and it's really a privilege to be here to witness it. Um, and of course, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight and being part of this important discussion and journey ahead. Thanks very much. Merci. Miigwech. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Well, I think... Uh, the city uh, was definitely shaken up by that uh, McLean's cover, but uh, here we are, you know, not quite a year later, and uh, we're a city with an Indigenous mayor, a city with two, uh, two Indigenous members of Parliament. So there's progress being made, and yet we're still also a city uh, where we lost Tina Fontaine, and a city where Rennell Harper was uh, brutally attacked. So as much as there's hope, there's also still some severe challenges uh, to be met. And I think that that's what reconciliation is going to look like. It's not going to happen in one fell swoop. It's not going to be clean. It's going to be messy. It's going to be challenging. But it happens when we show up and we engage with one another and we, we stay at the table and we remain committed. So I want to thank you for your leadership and thank you for your remarks tonight. So at this time, we're going to invite our uh, gracious hosts here at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights to share some words with us. Speaking on behalf of CMHR, I'm going to invite up uh, friend uh, Jennifer Nipanak, who is the Senior Advisor of Aboriginal Programming and Learning. So please give her a warm welcome. Miigwech, Wab. Anin, Animakeashik, 
in addition to cars, my quite doing them. I'm going to go see Ben Dungi. Kichimi Gwech, Gabi Jayek, Manungam. Uh, I want to begin, I know Fred, uh, Fred Kelly, Elder Fred Kelly is here with us tonight and he's going to be offering some uh, ceremony and, and some words for us this evening and, uh, and I certainly want to acknowledge him uh, before I start my words tonight and know that uh, he always starts us off in a good way and I want to say kachimigwech to you Fred, uh, my friend, my mentor and, uh, and my family for always ensuring that we, we do the best that we can here at the museum. I appreciate your support always so I say kachimigwech. So hello everyone, and uh, again, as uh, Wab had noted, my name is Jennifer Niepenak, and I'm the Senior Advisor on uh, Indigenous Relations here at the Com Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And on behalf of the President and the CEO, I'd like to welcome everyone, um, my pleasure and my honour to welcome everyone here tonight um, for the National Association Friendship Centre's first Indigenous Innovation Summit. <laughs> Mouthful, to roll off your tongue. Um, I'd like to start by, that has been noted here earlier today by, uh, by, by, by everybody that's come up, is that uh, we're acknowledging the land that this museum sits on, has always been, and will continue to be the home of Indigenous peoples. This place connects us to all Indigenous ancestors who followed the waterways here to the centre of this continent for peacemaking, dialogue and trade. This land is also more, more currently known as, noted again earlier, as Treaty 1 territory in the heartland of the Métis all of which is to remind us that Aboriginal peoples continue to be connected to these ancestral lands. And on that note, I would, I would ask you to sort of look over to my right here, and this is our um, artistic element related specific to ancestral lands. So I'd ask you to, if you have a moment at some point tonight or over the next few days while you're in Winnipeg, to, and if you have an opportunity to come back to the museum to take a look at that, it speaks to that concept of, of the history of this, this really important place here in Winnipeg. And uh, there's, we have a footprint on a floor here that was actually exca excavated during excavation that was located here that's been dated back six, 700 years. So. Again, this is a really important element for the museum here, so if you have a chance, please do take a look tonight. So, reconciliation as a form of innovation is a powerful concept. Here at the museum, we believe that reconcilia reconciliation is important to all Canadians. We also believe that our role as a museum is to be a space for education, reflection, and respectful dialogue. This past August, we created a new exhibit about the work of the Truth and Reconcilia Reconciliation of Canada. Commission of Canada, again, which was noted here again, the work of uh, Justice Sinclair that we're all um, aware of and very, um, again, we're very honoured to have you here tonight to speak. Um, the special exhibit in the, was um, added in addition to Indigenous content that can been, be found throughout each and every one of the mu museum's 10 core galleries, presented as an integral part of Canada's story and world history. And I know just before um, many of you arrived for uh, this particular session, we had provided some tours and, and I, I know a few of you had the opportunity to go through, so hopefully you had a chance to look at some of those, those galleries. So again, the museum is committed to working with Indigenous peoples. In our galleries, we feature the work of contemporary Indigenous artists such as Janine Crouchy and Rebecca Balmore, as well as the words of Indigenous writers and thinkers such as Josephine Bacon, Maria Campbell, and Taiki Alfred. I am pleased to let you know also that next month we will be welcoming the Witness Blanket, which will be officially open to the public on December 15th. The artist Carrie Newman created this large-scale art installation out of hundreds of items from across Canada. Items which have been reclaimed from residential schools, churches, government buildings, structures such as friendship centers, band offices and universities. I myself had the good fortune of meeting with um, the artist Carrie Newman a couple of months back to sort of have some discussions around what it was, you know, uh, what it was going to look like here at the museum in terms of the art installation and I can promise you it's very moving and it's an incredible, incredible um, um, piece of art, so uh, we hope to share it with many Canadians and our visitors from around the world in the upcoming months. The, the exhibit will be here right through till June next year. We're also proud to serve as a venue for this particular summit here tonight. Events like these facilitate important dialogue and reflection by bringing together innovators from across Canada. The summit is working to find new approaches to common challenges we all face. So on behalf of the CEO and President and on behalf of the museum, I welcome you all here tonight and wish you every success as we walk together for reconciliation. Kachimigwech. Thank you.
Aha miigwechke again, Jennifer. And we are uh, very happy to be here at the uh, beautiful museum. So at this time, we're going to uh, invite our panelists up onto the stage, and then Nimishume, uh, my uncle, Fred Kelly, uh, the esteemed elder leading us tonight, is going to uh, lead us in an invocation and uh, a sacred uh, pipe ceremony so that we can uh, observe uh, proper uh, protocol and respect the traditions of the Anishinaabe Nation. So at this time, I'd like to invite up to the stage each of our panelists, the Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair, Chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Rai Moran, Director of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, Stephen Kakfui, the ninth Premier of the Northwest Territories, Founder and President of Canadians for a New Partnership and past President of the Dene Nation, Jessica Bolduc, Project Coordinator of the 4Rs Movement, and Karen Joseph, Executive Director of Reconciliation Canada. All right, Fred. You got them right where you want them. Yes. Well, I can make it up there. Bonjour is the links, and I hear some uh, conversations in the green room as they're getting ready over here. Uh, Murray Sinclair is going to get a good kick at the cat tonight. <laughs> I almost took offense to that, but anyway. So before I get into the solemnities, I'm going to make a few comments, and I took a, a little snippet of each one of these guys' written speeches, so I, if I sound good, then I'll take the credit. If it's not good, you blame them, okay? So it's all good to be here. How do you all feel now? Are you all okay? Good. Glad to hear that, because I want you to applaud one of the greatest nations in, upon the land in which we stand, and those of you, my brothers, my younger brothers and sisters, when I say that, I'm talking about historically and chronologically, the great Métis Nation. This is your homeland, the province of Manitoba. This is your land, and I acknowledge you. As an elder, I have been called an elder, and here I am at uh, what I saw up on the screen, a summit. Looked like I'm over the hill. So, uh, but anyway, uh, what constitutes an elder? So what constitutes an elder? What constitutes an old man? Because the elder and the, uh, and the chronological age are not necessarily synonymous. But in my case, they may be. So what is, I've always wanted to hear the definition of an elder. I want to hear and what a 73-year-old what a is supposed to look like, what he's supposed to feel like, and all these kind of things. I went to see my doctor today, and I find out now. See, all these beautiful women from all over the country here, and I said, I told him, I said, look at all these beautiful women. I said, my, my hips start to sway. He says, oh, that's only arthritis. <laughs> I said, my blood starts to boil. He says, that's high blood pressure. <laughs> so I said, you know, well, but maybe those are symptoms. Anyway, I'm here to tell you a few little things over here. And uh, the, uh, before I get into, the, say, the solemnity of uh, the occasion. And one thing I want to point out to you is this. I do not use notes when I, uh, when I speak. But there are certain things and certain quotations that I have to refer to from time to time to avoid my senior moments. And here is a footnote at the end of an article that I found today. Fun fact, a time-honored wedding tradition in Winnipeg is the Manitoba Social. A prenuptial fundraising party for the almost wed. Most socials follow the same formula. Hire a hall, sell tickets, 
and pack in as many people as you can to dance, to drink, and to bid on prizes, or buy raffles and give the proceeds to the wedding couple. That's one effect. And I'll tell you where I picked this up. I don't know if the mayor is aware of this. Did you know that the National Geographic has just published its 2016 version and listed uh, Winnipeg as one of the places to visit of all places around the world, including such places as New York City, such places as Brazil, the Philippines, Japan, all exotic places, and Winnipeg is right there. So, This is not a paid announcement, by the way, <laughs> from the mayor's office. <laughs> but I'll gladly take the honorary. <laughs> the reason why I mention this is because we are here at the heartland of the Métis Nation, the Anishinaabe Nation, the Dene, the Dakota, the Lakota, and the Cree, all of whom gathered in the confluence of the Red River and the, uh, the river systems that we, that we have, what we call the forks. And that to me is symbolic, the confluence of differences, different directions coming together in a place that we are standing on. And this is a museum for human rights. And this is a city that, of course, was labeled as the racist capital of Canada, as was alluded to earlier. And I uh, beg to differ on that. It is not the racist capital. If anything is, Canada would then be the racist country of the world. So we're all tainted by the same illusions. But here we are this evening talking about reconciliation as innovation. And what does reconciliation mean? One of the reconciliations that we talk about are the fact of facing the history of harms that may have been done by different parties to one another. Facing the honest truth. And I pick up on that theme for the simple reason that there was a time when this museum was prohibited and got involved in the controversy of, over the word genocide. And the board of directors and the staff were accused of not acknowledging genocide. Immediately, and I have no reason to defend anybody, but I make my own observations. My observation was, do you think is the Asper who dreamed and who envisioned this center? And that his children, David, Gail, and his relations, and the Jewish community, would you believe and this was the question I asked. Would you think that they do not know anything about genocide? Would you happen to think that those people, the Ukrainian community, the Japanese community, those genocides would have been recognized? And would you think that I, having experienced the residential school, the onslaught of the residential school experience from the age of four and a half years old onward, and the experimentation that went on from 1947 to 1952 at six of the residential schools, two of which were in Kenora, one of which was St. Mary's School, which I attended from four and a half years old, and experimentation was done on me. Do you think I do not know what genocide is? If we're going to face facts, this is what we're doing, and these are the challenges that have been referred to. I'm not here to tell you and uh, create a diatribe against what has happened. I'm just saying that if we're going to face the honest truth, then this in fact is a reconciliation of facts that happened, including the very fact of genocide. And I understand now that I, another government was not necessarily keen on having the word genocide being used in the a federal structure. Neither was that particular government very happy about using the word victim and survivors. Former, res former residents of residential schools would have, been the, uh, would have been the appropriate term. So, in as much as I am not too concerned about semantics, it's the concepts, it's the feelings, and so you are here to face the truth, and you are here to face reconciliation as the panel will be talking to you about. And so, 
I ask then, I'm going to be lighting a pipe. And this pipe is a very ancient pipe that has been handed down to me from generations. The first time I am aware the word has been used was in 1701 at a gathering of 41 nations. Not First Nations or as bands under the internet, nations that traveled from the prairies and all over Turtle Island and convened the land of two mountains, which is now known as Montreal area and Oka. And this pipe was used to make reconciliation. Because what you see in Hollywood and what they refer to as peace pipes is really a healing pipe of dealing with reconciliation. And fast forward to the time when Premier Campbell challenged NISCA agreement, and in his judgment, when Campbell challenged that, he said, you cannot give to a third party, you cannot give to a third order of government powers that have already been divided amongst the federal and provincial governments. And his response, more or less in these words, said, it is true that the two levels of government divided powers amongst themselves, but they could only divide powers that belong to them. Aboriginal powers did not belong to them. And I hail that particular comment. And he referred to treaties as a matter of treaty. The purpose of treaties is to reconcile sovereignties. This confluence represents the confluence of sovereignties, where reconciliation needs to take place amongst our people with the Canadian people. Notwithstanding that governments and of the day may stand in the way, it's the Canadian people that are supposed to be the government. And I see that you are over here to seek reconciliation. I believe in the people of Canada. I believe in you, that when we extend our hand, that you will be there. And also, we have another challenge. And I believe that we, as the Aboriginal people, the First Nations, the Anishinaabe, and all of those Indigenous peoples of this land, will be welcoming the refugees. Man, no man, we have experience with refugees and immigrants. And we will, notwithstanding governments, our people will welcome these people. Yes, we are short of houses. We, are, we still live in impoverished conditions, but we welcome other people to share what we have. And I'm sure that Canadians also join that. So, I'm not going to lecture to you. I'm just making a few comments and a few observations based on what I have seen over a period of time. So, and as I said before, I get to the solemnity. This pipe I'm going to light on your behalf as it's in the spirit of reconciliation. And I'm going to share this pipe with a panel who will be talking about reconciliation, that they will be guided and that they will be inspired internally and spiritually as they talk of the reconciliation and that we will learn from them. And with that, my dear friends, I also want to get now into to tell you what I am going to be talking about with respect to all that. But first also, I need to give you some advice as an elder because you expect always, you always expect some advice from an elder. Well, here I am. I'm not gonna miss that opportunity. The Christmas season is upon us. So, you know where the angel came from? The angel that sits on top of the tree? Well, I have to tell you the truth. I have to tell you legends that are based on truth because there's morals to these stories. It was, a moment, it was Christmas Eve. Santa Claus was in a very bad mood. He had a cold. Mrs. Claus, her cookies had burnt. Everything was going wrong. The elves were drunk. And so were the reindeer. And walked a little angel into the front room where Santa was singing, brooding, fuming. And I uh, said, what can I do for you, fatso? He said, I need a, I need a Christmas tree. Okay, he said, go get me one. So the angel went and got one. Walked back into the room after a little while. Okay, fatso, we're, what do you want me to do with this tree? That's why you see an angel on top of the Christmas tree. <laughs> And one little more word of advice to you. If you see a fat man in a red suit being pulled across the sky by a reindeer, and you believe it's a happy occasion, get yourself to a detox. <laughs> <laughs> a 
With those bits of advice, I'm not going to go into the solemnity, okay? And by the way, as I do this, those of you that have received, you've all received a berry. Part of the ceremony is to acknowledge the grandmother and the ladies of our societies without whom we would not be here. They are the keepers of the water. So you will drink your water, and that's why you've been given some water. If you're wondering what to do with it, and also you've been given a berry for some berries that you will share as part of the way our people share with one another. And then I will say a few more words before I vacate this, uh, this spot here. Hey, if you want. Go ahead. Sure. Please be seated. I would like you to join me in a vision. 
arching from the ancient past into the distant future of future generations that are here with us even though we don't see them yet. They are here with us. And it is for them that we do all of these things. Arching from the distant past, as I say, to the future is the rainbow and its seven resplendent colors that represent the seven laws of creation. Love, kindness, sharing, respect, truth, courage, and humility. Those are the ones that, con that converge as the confluence of the rivers upon which we stand in the memory of our ancestors and in the memory of those residential school survivors and in the memory of those people that were not here to see it, although they are watching spiritually. I acknowledge them. And with that, I want to share with you the fact of these seven laws of creation, some, some people refer to them as the seven teachings, the seven grandfather teachings, whatever you refer to them as, they are laws amongst our people. And this is what we are celebrating when we are talking about the reconciliation. So please join me within that vision and listen carefully. And one little bit of solemn advice. When you look at your neighbors beside you or afterwards, look to see the Creator in your neighbor. Look to see the Creator and the spirits and the spiritual being inside each individual. We're all worthy. We're all children of the Creator. Together, we are one family. Miigwech. Thank you, uh, Fred. So at this time, we're going to uh, invite up uh, our honored guest for the evening, uh, the Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair. I think uh, he's a man who is familiar to everybody in the room for his uh, dignity and the grace and the uh, tremendous uh, intellectual, I think, tenor that he has set for this project of uh, reconciliation, both in his actions during the course of the uh, commission, but uh, also very notably in the way that the uh, executive summary of the final report was uh, written. So please join me in welcoming uh, to the stage uh, our first panelist for the evening, the uh, chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair. I, um, I I don't know what to say. Everything I was going to say has been said by our uncle. <laughs> he took the words right off of my speech here. He said, <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have left it laying around in the green room. So. <laughs> it's like he can read your mind. Do you want this? Um, I want to uh, acknowledge all of you who are here this evening, in addition to the territory that we're on in the homeland of the Métis, in Treaty No. 1, of which I am a member. But I also want to acknowledge that uh, you have ventured out on this very, very wintry night when uh, there are people who are still struggling to get home uh, right now, with the uh, streets being as icy as they are. So uh, I congratulate you on your perseverance on your, um, maybe you haven't even left here yet. Have you been here all day? Is that <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, they told us at the beginning that the uh, museum is going to let us, uh, let us be here for as long as we want to be. 
and we can stay here and finish this work and do everything that we want to this evening and uh, we don't have to worry about time. So I think they must know something about the weather that we don't know. <laughs> um, and a warning that we have uh, maybe to make the night here. Uh, this gathering is a, a timely one, I think. I think it's an interesting approach to the question of discussing reconciliation. And when I was invited to do it, I, uh, to, to participate and to uh, participate with the panelists, but also to make a, a presentation on the issue of reconciliation as innovation, uh, it made me pause and think and, and wonder, well, what can I really say about that? Um, I remember when I went to law school that uh, one of my mentors, one of the lawyers who uh, encouraged me to go to law school said, you know, when you have a law degree, everybody thinks you know everything. They think you know the, an the answers to everything. So it's like uh, perhaps they thought I knew what that really meant. Reconciliation is innovation. <laughs> And uh, I really had to think about that and try to figure out what is it that we're really talking about here. Because the two words themselves are unique words. You know, innovation is about something new, doing something in a new way, thinking about something in a new way. And reconciliation is about bringing things together or putting things back in order. And so if you put those words together, Maybe it's about how we put things back in order in a new way. And we put things back together in a new way. We think about things and we think about our relationship in a new way. And the more I thought about it, and uh, perhaps uh, it's just one of those things that happen when you start thinking about a particular line of reasoning, you just follow it to its natural conclusion and everything else gets excluded. I don't want you to think that that's the only way to think about it, but the more I thought about it, then uh, the faster I started going down that slippery slope and, uh, and started to think about, well, what is it that that means? Thinking about putting things together or coming to an understanding of our relationship with each other in a new way. Because uh, in some ways, when we started talking about reconciliation as a commission at the outset, we borrowed existing terms. And I've mentioned many times, and it's in our report, that we, uh, we actually assigned to our staff as a project right at the beginning to come up with all of the possible definitions of the word reconciliation. And the, the list was in the range of 130 different definitions of the word reconciliation, depending upon context, you know. As I've often said, you know, reconciliation to an accountant means something different than reconciliation to a social worker and something different again to a lawyer. And reconciliation even has meaning, I'm told, to a mechanic who's trying to figure out how to put a car back together and still not have parts left over. They, so the word reconciliation is one of those tricky words. It's a trappy kind of word because if you get into looking at it in a particular way, then you forget about everything else. And sometimes we found ourselves in that situation with some of the survivors talking about reconciliation as forgiveness and, um, and talking about the fact that they were not prepared to forgive anybody. I hate everybody. I don't want to forgive anybody. Too much has happened to me, and I don't want to forgive. They're not entitled to my forgiveness. And we heard many people say, I'm not ready to reconcile yet. And, uh, and I think it's because they got caught into that, that uh, trap of thinking about reconciliation in a particular way and, and locking themselves into that thought that reconciliation called for forgiveness. And that one of the events early on in our work, I warned the, um, the people who were gathered at that event, and subsequently I, I, I would mention this as well, that as far as I'm concerned, you don't have to forgive anybody in order to participate in a process of reconciliation. You can decide never to talk to each other again 
never to have anything to do with each other again. And that's a form of reconciliation. You can, you can talk about never wanting to address the issue with your perpetrator, and that's a form of reconciliation. It's coming to terms with something from the past, and really that's what we want to do. But it's also coming to terms with it in a way that leaves you with a sense of uh, self, a proper sense of self, with a sense of your own identity strong and your own ability to cope with all of the issues of life no longer being hampered by the pain of that past. But in a way as well, that's a false assumption as well. Dr. Reg Croshu, who's one of our um, uh, consultants and worked with us on a panel of, on traditional knowledge keepers said that he had been told by his grandfather that you can, you can um, get away from the past, you can be through with your past, he said, his grandfather had told him, but the past may never be through with you, which makes you think about the legacy and the ongoing issues around the past. So that word reconciliation needs to be thought about in terms of what is it that we can reasonably mean, and what is it that we can use in terms of the, the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was tempting sometimes just to forget about it and just move on with the, the statement gathering for the, with the survivors, but in reality, that wouldn't have been fair to everybody. They were looking to the Commission to help come to terms with this past in a way that gave them that sense of balance. And so we, we took what seemed to be what everybody agreed upon was an achievable definition and model of reconciliation, and that is to, to establish a relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people in this country that was mutually respectful. That is not the only possible definition of reconciliation, but it's one that we thought reflected the issues as we understood were coming out of the history of residential schools in this country. And you will see throughout our summary report and throughout our final report when we issue it next month that we talk about that as being the objective of our discussion of reconciliation in this country. The establishment, ultimately, of a mutually respectful relationship. And it's because the, the term was so tricky that we knew we had to put a, a definition, or at least an objective around reconciliation forward, that would make sense and that would be achievable. It's something that we could work towards. It may not be achievable in our lifetime. We acknowledge that. But it's something that we can aim towards. Because coming to terms with the past and establishing a mutually respectful relationship is, in many ways, talking about things that people understand at a very fundamental level. It's about talking a, about friends and friendships. It's talking about family relationships and the fact that if you are living side by side with somebody, you have to figure out how to get along together. And that's a form of reconciliation. You don't have to like each other. We're not telling people to be in love all the time. But we are telling people to be respectful toward each other. And so by putting some definition to the word, by putting some parameters around the word reconciliation, it allowed us to think then about how we could achieve that. And that's where I think innovation kicked in for us. Because then we started talking amongst ourselves, how can we help to achieve that in the long run? And if you look at the work that we did as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and how we did our work, in many ways, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a very innovative process, I think. I don't want to be uh, boasting here. I just I want you to know that we thought carefully about how we were going to do our work because we wanted the work 
to achieve a number of objectives. First of all, we wanted the survivors to have a, uh, a safe, secure, and open environment in which they could talk to the public and to each other about what they had experienced in the schools. And we knew that statement gathering could have occurred perhaps even more easily than the way we did it if we had simply taken survivors into rooms in various places and said, here, talk into this microphone and tell us your story. And if we had recorded the statements of survivors in that very private way, in that non-public way, and recorded all of those statements, we probably would have gotten more than 6,700 statements, which is how many we've recorded. We probably would have been able to achieve a higher number of recorded statements from survivors. We probably would have been able to get into more people's homes and lives than we did. But then an important segment of the public would not have benefited from listening to those stories. And that important segment of the public were the other survivors. You thought I was going to say the public, didn't you? But it's the other survivors. The other survivors needed to be validated in their stories. They needed to know that they were not alone. And they knew that intuitively by virtue of the fact that they were there when things happened to other people. And they knew that other people were there when things happened to them. But they had been keeping their stories secret for so long that they came to believe that it was a total secret. And when they heard other people talking about things that had happened to them, it gave them license to come forward and talk about what happened to them. And so by doing it in that very open and public way, we didn't preclude private statements from being given in, in private rooms and, and in front of cameras only or in front of audio recording devices only. We didn't stop that from happening. But by allowing the survivors to tell their stories in public, it really helped other survivors to feel a sense of healing, to feel that they too even though they might never have been able and might not have been able and still may not have actually spoken their story out loud. They heard somebody else tell a story that was similar to theirs and they heard people say that was wrong and that was not your fault, which is how, what we told all the survivors, that we believe you and that was not your fault. And because of that, the taking of the statements was an innovative approach to the healing of many survivors. We have received some adverse comment from people about the fact that of the 80,000 people who are still alive at the time the settlement agreement was reached who could have come forward and given us statements, we recorded only 77,000 approximately statements, which is less than 10%. But when you look at the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they were a much lower percentage than we were. And no other Truth and Reconciliation Commission has approached the percentage that we achieved in terms of the number of people who were victimized by government policy and who recorded their statements in that way. Because the approach that we took encouraged people in their process of healing, but also encourage them to feel validated. Encourage them to come forward because they knew that they would be believed. And so the Commission's work and the way that we went about our work was, I think, uh, an innovative way of doing things. We weren't the only Commission to take statements in public. It all started for me when I was even before law school, when I was a young student in university, watching the Berger Commission, the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry, and the way that Tom Berger did his inquiry back in the early 1970s. 
and how he allowed all of the people in the North who wanted to talk to him about the pipeline to do so in a very public, community-oriented way. And that was the model that we chose, but I knew that it was a good model because it was the model that we also used when I was the co-commissioner of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry to go into the communities and to allow people to talk to the commissioners in a very open and public way. And I think that the work of the commission in doing that, because it was unique to many people of the public who had never had an opportunity to see it and to see that form of process happening, had a very significant and direct impact upon their lives. When we released the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a summary of our final report, in June of this year, many Canadians, maybe not the majority, but many Canadians had heard what survivors had to say already. They were aware of the stories from residential schools. They had seen, visibly seen, the survivors tell their statements on television, on videos, in news releases and news reports. And they had heard others publicly talking about these stories. And so when our report was released, people were looking for a solution. And it made our delivery of our calls to action a very easy process, or perhaps a much easier process, but because there was a receptive audience out there, because of the work that had gone into the way we gathered the statements. We had already engaged the public in the work that we were doing. And that innovative approach of how we did that work I think has contributed to that significant movement towards reconciliation that we see out there. But it not only benefited the survivors, and it not only engaged the public in thinking about reconciliation very early on in our process, the other thing that it did was it gave to the intergenerational survivors, the children, the grandchildren, the nephews, the nieces, the younger people who had been raised with or by survivors of residential schools. It gave them a sense of knowing why things are the way they are. They now knew why their aunts and uncles behaved like they did. They now knew why their mothers and fathers behaved like they did. And that gave them a sense of connection, a sense of uh, ability to forgive their parents because they knew that it wasn't their parents' fault. But more importantly, it lifted from the intergenerational survivors this unspoken feeling that perhaps we were inferior people, like the residential schools and the public schools said. Perhaps there was something wrong with us, that we were so dysfunctional. Perhaps everything that was going wrong in our lives as a people was our fault. And when they heard the survivors speak, and they heard the survivors tell their stories in that very public way, and they heard of the abuses that they experienced in residential schools, they realized that their ancestors, their parents, their grandparents were the way they were because of the trauma that they had experienced in the schools. And they came finally to believe that they were not inferior, that it wasn't their fault that our people were indeed so strong people for having simply come through that, for having persevered and lived through that, and for having been strong enough to survive that. In Nelson Mandela's inauguration, he quoted from the poem Invictus, my head is bloody but unbowed. What a line that is, you know? My head is bloodied but unbowed. I am the master of my ship. I am the captain of my soul. 
Those phrases make you realize that no matter what others do to you, the fact that you have survived such terrible treatment speaks not only of their evil, but of your strength and of your strength as a people. And so the intergenerational population, the intergenerational students stood up during the Idle No More times because they knew that they could do that and they knew that they should do that. It contributed to that movement in a significant way, more than people realize perhaps. But that innovative approach of how we went about our work helped people to begin to think about how we should start to deal with all of these things. Our emphasis on survivors telling their stories also, I think, contributed in another way to our ability to influence social and legal institutions in this country. Since the work of the Commission began, we have seen some very interesting decisions coming out of the courts of this land. And actually, since the lawsuits began from the residential school survivors in the 1990s. We have seen some very interesting decisions coming from the courts of this land from judges who have been influenced by the knowledge that they have now been told about of what's gone on in residential schools and of that connection to the legacies that are before them. They now understand, for example, why crown sovereignty is a legitimate question to raise and that it needs itself to be reconciled with Aboriginal title, with the inherent right of Aboriginal people to run their own affairs, that it's no longer a closed question, as former courts had said, that it is an open and valid question to raise. And it's one of the great unresolved legal issues in this country. And when it does get resolved, if it ever does, when it does get resolved, this history this story, this experience, is going to have an influence in their thinking because they now know that Aboriginal people didn't ask for this, didn't surrender to this, that they were forced into the situation that they're now experiencing. The other a yeah, significant issue that, we, that I just want to flag for you as part of the work that we did that I think was very important um, was, were two things. One was the, the use of ceremony and the participation of all of us who were involved in the TRC in ceremony, traditional ceremony of the participants who were with us on that day, and our willingness to go into their communities and participate in their ceremonies was important to the survivors as a, a mark of our respect for them. But it was also uh, important for them because they all received a sense, even though many of them were Christians, they all received a sense of validation, again, from the fact that ceremony was being permitted and encouraged. And at the end of each day, we always, as commissioners, participated in ceremony with the survivors a smudging ceremony or a song and dance ceremony or, or some other kind of ceremony that would engage us with them. And we always told them at the end of the day what we had heard them say and that we had no reason to disbelieve them and that we believed them. We always told them that. And that's part of our understanding of what the responsibility of bearing witness, which we were asked to accept in the work that we did, engaged. The, the giving back to the party, the story of what it is that we had seen and what it is that we had witnessed. And the other component of that was the presence and utilization of health and cultural supports. Every single survivor who testified with us was allowed to sit with someone who would be able to comfort them, to give them strength, to help them through their statements, because many of them needed that help. 
Whatever they found their strength, that's who they could have with them. Many of them chose family members to sit with them, but many of them chose elders, ceremony people. Some of them participated in a ceremony while they were giving their statement because that's how they managed to get through that. So the use of the cultural supports and the health supports, uh, the health support people being professionally trained, really helped the process along as well. And I remember when we were talking about having this process in place for ourselves, I remember talking to our staff and to my colleagues, Commissioner Marie Wilson and Commissioner Wilton Littlechild, that when I had watched and observed the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings, I was always struck by the fact that everybody who told a story or gave a statement to that commission was allowed to sit with two grandmothers. Those grandmothers sat on either side of the witness, and they comforted the witness as the witness testified, because the witnesses were often telling of terrible things that had been done to them, and they were having difficulty getting through that. So they always ensured that two grandmothers, two elderly women, sat with them to help them through that testimony. And so we concluded that that's something that we would try to ensure as well, that they would be able to have whoever they wanted to sit with them to help them through their statements. In a court of law, you're not allowed that. You're not allowed to have somebody sit beside you and hold your hand while you're testifying. And so it was a different approach. And initially, some survivors were a little surprised at that, but they knew that it was something that was important to them because they all accepted it, with a few exceptions, but they all accepted it. And finally, I just want to say that another innovative technique that we thought was important to our work was we didn't use the word recommendations. Sometimes we lapse into it in our everyday conversation. But we use the term calls to action when we talk about what it is that we concluded needed to be done. Because for us, the word recommendation is like a suggestion, you know? It's like, well, you don't really have to do this if you don't want to, but here's a recommendation, you know? I recommend that you do it nicer. I recommend that you go here instead of there. But a call to action really is a more aggressive terminology, a more directive set of words. And so our use of that word was intentional. I want you to know that. It was not something that we carelessly pulled together. It was intentional for us to do that because it was time, it is time for this country to begin to do what it needs to do to deal with this history. And so it, we're way beyond the need for recommendations. We studied every single inquiry that ever looked into a situation involving Aboriginal people since inquiries were first started back in the 1950s. We looked at every one of their works and every single one of them used the word recommendation. And for the most part, including my own inquiry, Every single one of them got ignored, largely. But the one thing that we are noticing is that our calls to action are not getting ignored. And we designed them in a way, as I said at the closing event, we designed them not for the government that was in office at that time, because we suspected they might not be too eager to take action. But we said, when there is a government that is ready to take action, they now have the map. They now know what it is that they need to do. And they will know what they need to do because all of those other elements of society that we have called to action also know what they need to do. We issued calls to action to the educational system, to the justice system, to the child welfare system, to people involved in universities, to people involved in business and industry, 
So we said each and every one of you has a responsibility to take action in the way that you are doing business, in the things that you are doing. Regardless of what the federal government does or any other government does, you can affect change in the way that you do your business, your work. You conduct your affairs. And every single one of us, as friends, as neighbors, as human beings, we call you to action as well, to begin to look at the way that you think, to begin to look at the way that you talk to and about Aboriginal people. Because you are going to be the most important foundation for reconciliation going forward. And that innovation, that technique that we used of changing the terminology slightly, I think has had a dramatic impact upon the conversation. And we know that there is now a movement out there that has exceeded what governments were willing to do. You heard of many processes that are now in place and will continue to be in place. And the one thing that we remind people constantly is that once you're on that road, you can't step off of it. Once you engage in dialogue around reconciliation, that's not a conversation that you can stop. It's going to continue because it's an ongoing commitment. It's not that one that you want to, it's not one that you voluntarily make, it's one that you have to make. Once you say it, you gotta do it. It's that simple. And so, because of the realization that people are now facing today in this country, we know and we're confident as commissioners that things are going to change. And we are happy and, and satisfied that we have started the ball rolling, so to speak. We have started people in this dialogue on reconciliation. But the best part of it is, I think, is that we have done our work in such a way that this commission is going to disappear in six weeks, but reconciliation will go on forever. I want you all now to, to understand that reconciliation as innovation is really nothing more than imagining. Imagine what it will be like in the future when we begin to do things in the right way. Imagine what it will be like for your children and for your grandchildren and for their children. Imagine what it will be like for those children seven generations from now when we start doing these things, these little things that we need to do today, and they magnify over that period of time. Imagine what their lives will be like, and imagine what it will be like for them to look back at what we do today, and imagine them being able to say, I thank my ancestors for doing that, because they have made our lives better. That's what innovation is about imagination, using your imagination to think about the way things need to be and doing what you can to make that happen. I want to thank you for letting me be part of this evening's event, and I know that tomorrow morning you're going to have to listen to me again. I'll try to come up with another speech that Fred won't steal. <laughs> but I thank you for letting me be part of this and for sharing this evening with me. Miigwech. Jimmy Gwich Murray, I want to thank you for uh, challenging us with the calls to action, 94 calls to action in the TRC report. 
And uh, having been uh, in the room where several of those calls to action were being discussed and hearing people express hesitation or worry that we're not going to be able to do all these things, I would like to thank you, perhaps more importantly, for giving us that historic context about why it's so important for us to at least try, to at least show up and answer the calls to action. Now that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is winding uh, down, the uh, archive, but also part of the mission of reconciliation, will be uh, handed over to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which is a new research center, museum, and living archive uh, hosted at the University of Manitoba. They will also have uh, a sister site at the University of British Columbia and a traveling exhibit, as well as a digital archive so that every generation of Canadian from here on in can learn the truth about what happened in the residential school era and study uh, all this huge compendium of knowledge and story that has been uh, collected by the uh, TRC. So at this time we're going to invite up uh, the executive director of the NCTR, uh, Mr. Rai Moran. So please welcome him to the stage. Okay, sounds good. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, well, it was certainly uh, very nice to hear Justice Sinclair say such uh, nice words about the statement gathering process, because as the director of statement gathering at the TRC, it would have been very awkward to sit on the stage and hear bad things said about it. So <laughs> thank you for that. You saved me from a, 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 an awkward situation there. Uh, you know, the, the statement gathering process of the TRC, I think, is a really good place to start the dialogue about not only where we were, but where we're going. And not only was the process that we undertook at the TRC innovative for the purposes of empowering survivors to start to see healing through the lived experiences of other survivors, we also have created this massive collection of information. And this massive collection of information is now stored at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And it's, it's important to recognize that that process in and of itself was actually fairly complicated and actually required a fair amount of forethought. And what did that mean? Well, we know the pace of digital change is rapid. And we know that the world is evolving in incredibly fast ways now. To put things in perspective, when I first started with the TRC in 2010, I thought, man, it would be so great to have an iPad in every room so that we could track the metadata and what people were saying and we could drop a little point onto a Google map. Believe it or not, 2010 iPads were not yet available in Canada. You know, So we think about how much that piece of technology, the tablet device, has revolutionized our world today and that wasn't there when we started. So change is happening really fast and what we had to do at the beginning of the Commission's work is try to project as far forward as we could and try and future-proof our recording, future-proof our technology as much as possible so that it could at least stand the test of time for as long as humanly possible. So what did that look like? Well, it meant that we used HD recording devices. We were actually the first agency in the country to develop uh, processes to record long format HD recordings where we could record seven, eight hours at the time because that's what it meant in order to record survivors and the commission's events where the commissioners were on stage and, and listening to survivors. And that has given us an incredible gift collectively because as much as there have been many people that have heard the stories, there are thousands, if not, well, millions, truthfully, that have not heard the stories of survivors. And as much as the survivor stories were helpful for survivors to let go of some of their pain, they fundamentally must and should transfer some of that pain onto non-Indigenous peoples. And those, those survivor statements fundamentally should and must destabilize how we feel about this country. We should collectively feel as Canadians that something is fundamentally wrong in this country and something has been fundamentally wrong for a very long period of time and it needs to change and it needs to change now. And if you haven't felt that yet or if there's people out there that haven't felt that yet, they need to feel it. They need to hear that survivor talk about what it was like to be ripped from their parent. They need to 
put themselves in that person's shoes as the parent or as the child, and to develop that deep sense of empathy, of humanity, of connection to that person and the terrible tragedy often that they went through. Because we need to feel that collectively as a country and that's what's really going to be able to enable us to change. It can be sort of, you know, a nice conversation. Oh, reconciliation, let's get along and this is going to be really great. But we really have to feel it. We've got to feel it right in our soul. We've got to feel it right in our gut that it has to change. So that's the one of the, I think, the innovative things about this collection that we've amassed now is that we've actually taken all of these survivor statements that Justice Sinclair and the other commissioners and my good friend Jeff Ward in the back collected across the country in, in thousands of locations. And they're available online for people now, along with millions upon millions of documents. And that means that for those people that haven't had the opportunity to sit down and sit with a survivor, that it's possible to do so. And that can happen next year, and it can happen two years from now, it can happen five years from now, it can happen 50 years from now. Because this is a history that we can never forget, and it's a history that we must not ever forget. So that has given us, I think, a, a huge opportunity through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process. And the innovation of this process is that there is this living archive at the end of it. RCAP, the AJI, numerous other uh, inquiries have gone across the country, have talked to thousands of people, and those voices were translated into transcripts which now sit in archives and sometimes collect dust. And this notion of a living archive and about keeping the fire lit on the story of reconciliation and continuing to honor the voices of survivors throughout time will continue to enable societal transformation as we grow and as we learn and frankly as we fail as a country because reconciliation is not a straight line journey and it's going to be one where we have to keep checking in on where we are, where we were and where we're going. My last thought that I'll leave you with, uh, because there's lots of other great speakers here that are going to say wonderful things and who are doing wonderful things in, in many different ways, is that through the development of empathy and through the recognition that we have not gotten it right in this country for a very long time, comes the potential to really start to listen. And through that listening comes the potential to really start to listen to Indigenous peoples. And through that potential of really listening to Indigenous peoples comes the ability to learn from them, the original inhabitants of this land, and to gain the wisdom and the knowledge that has existed right here with our friend who was walking here 600 years ago for 6,000 years. Now what is the true potential in that? What is the true potential for us as humans, us as a collective society, us as a transformative society to really start to embrace the knowledge of this land, embedded in the languages, embedded in the culture, embedded in the traditions that have been born out of this very land that we occupy or we sit on. So that's the exciting part and that's where we are going and that's the, the road ahead of us. And I'm excited about that road, so thank you. Oh, big witch, right? And I encourage you, uh, if you guys have some free time while you're here, go check out the NCTR over at the U of M. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to uh, invite up to the stage a personal hero of mine. He is a uh, former premier of the Northwest Territories and a past president of the uh, Dene Nation. But, uh, you know, I've uh, had a chance to get to know him a little bit, and I guess his current role as the uh, president and CEO, but really the, the driving force behind this new organization called Canadians for a New Partnership, which uh, brings together people from many different walks of life to try and spread the word about reconciliation and to challenge people in different sectors of our country to fulfill that vision. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Stephen Kakfui.
Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge all of you, the um, very esteemed people that I'm sitting with. Talking about reconciliation, the one thing I know is that it, it starts with me. When we watched our national leaders fighting on live TV in December of 2012, when we watched Chief Teresa Spence fasting in frustration, protesting the lack of attention that the government of this country was giving to our communities and our people. I knew I had to do something because my children were coming and saying, can you do something? And I said, I'm retired. I'm no longer elected. I don't do that kind of thing anymore. And they were in despair. I learned a long time ago to fight against being an introvert. As a residential school survivor, having spent seven and a half years there, the capacity and the ability to love, to trust, and to reach out was diminished. And yet, I did reach out that December to find a way to help Chief Teresa Spence, to try to find a way to give hope to my children and the young people of the Northwest Territories, that I began to call some people I knew. And I started with Joe Clark and Paul Martin, who called Sheila Fraser, Sheila Rogers, Ovid Mercury, Phil Fontaine, and it just went on and on. And what I realized is that we're all in different parts of the country in need of doing something because we could see this country was in trouble, that our youth were losing hope, that our leaders were floundering, and we needed to find some way to come together. And that was what Canadians for a New Partnership is. We also realized, because there's a big emptiness in many of us who are residential school survivors, and that's the spiritual aspect of being a human being. The ability to believe there's a creator, a power that we belong, and we can relate to the universe and that there's a place for us here. And so it was important for me to reach out and ask Dave Crescene to come and help us develop a strong spiritual path for us. Otherwise, we would be just another group. I asked Maria Campbell to join, and we've asked Elder Fred Kelly recently to come and join us as well. There is a very, very strong component of Canadians for New Partnership that is based right here in Manitoba. Because that is how I see the world that it has to start to center somewhere. And in my heart, three years ago, I figured it's going to be happening somewhere around Winnipeg, Manitoba. And we see it. And we see it happening. And it is incredibly gratifying to me to see that. I want to tell you that reconciliation started with me because I reached out to many, many, many people and they responded. Reconciliation starts with me because a long time ago I met a woman that I felt I could trust. Not a lot. 
and my limited ability to love was good enough for her. And through marriage, I realized I don't have the capability. And I don't know if you can imagine what that is like. That when my first child was going to be born, I was afraid that I would not be able to love. And that is the kind of things that thousands of us, I'm sure, have had to go through. My wife, Marie Wilson, and I have been together just about 40 years. And I've learned through her patience and her support to realize there's a big empty space inside me, an emptiness. that I could learn how to love and our children, our children were the ones that brought it here and reconciliation in this country is going to be led by our children because too many of us have been damaged, have been diminished by what happened to us. We will stand up and we become strong and we become warriors and that, yes, we are residential school survivors, but that was a long time ago. Forgiveness for me just came five years ago. It is very, very difficult to do the things we need to do. Reconciliation starts inside, and I realize that, and so that is part of my work. That is the part of the work I have to do. I don't know a lot about it, but I've reached out to learn to increase my capacity to love and to show compassion. To learn the ceremonies and the prayers and the songs of not only the Dene people, but the Cree and the Ojibwe and the Lakota and the Nakoda and start to feel comfortable to hear the songs and the ceremonies and to be part of it. That is very, very recent for me. That's what I'm doing. When I see Commissioner Justice Sinclair, I see an incredible man. But I do not see him alone. I see the three of them. Wilton Little Child and Marie Wilson. When I hear about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that is what I see. It is important to realize that Wilton has spent six years of his life doing this work as well, and that we should say their names more often in the course of our work, when we honor Justice Sinclair, when we honor the work of the Commission, there's nothing wrong with saying their names. I need to hear them. I need to know that we are honoring the work of three people. A residential school survivor, Wilton, a little child, Marie Wilson, the wife of a residential school survivor, and Justice Murray Sinclair, who has led that incredible team. Reconciliation is talking about recognizing the value that we all have. And I have to go home, so I want you to know I need you to recognize the work so that when I go home and she comes back from New Zealand, I can say, man, everybody was happy about all the great work you did alongside Justice Sinclair. So thank you very much. Masi Cho, Stephen. And I would encourage uh, all of you to check out the uh, 
declaration of uh, Canadians for a new partnership and uh, to consider uh, signing it and lending your name to uh, the work this, this organization is undertaking to advance uh, the project of reconciliation. But, you know, he's a very, uh, very humble man, you know, the way that he's uh, speaking of himself, displaying uh, one of the paramount virtues of Indigenous people, the humility. But he is cultivating that next generation of leaders. You know, I sat around his kitchen table hearing him advise uh, Denise, a young man who's now running for MLA in the territories and sharing his wisdom with him. And as I said, he's a role model and a hero to me. And uh, he and Marie have raised, you know, a wonderful family. And uh, one of their daughters, Kyla, is uh, very active in an organization called Dene Nawo, which is rebuilding Dene nationhood on the ground with young people in a very practical and a very tangible way that celebrates and rebuilds uh, the traditional ways of the Dene nation while also being fully connected to the, uh, to the modern world. So he spoke very humbly, but he's doing a lot and it's a truly remarkable thing to be there on the journey beside him. So Masi Stephen. And so uh, what better time to hear from a young person who is engaged in a similar sort of project. Next up to speak is Jessica Bolduke, the uh, project coordinator for the 4Rs movement. Now that's a collaboration of 14 national organizations working with youth to rebuild Canada. 4Rs seek to support a better future through reconciliation by creating opportunity for Indigenous and non-Indigenous young people to come together to discuss and learn from one another. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Jessica to the stage. Ani Bojo, hello everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here in Winnipeg and to hear these stories about this area and this place as being a gathering place. And the reason why I, I am really happy about that is because it reminds me of home. Um, I'm from a community called Batchewana First Nation and we're right in the heart of the Great Lakes. Um, and I've, I've got some friends from home right now so I can see their smiling faces being like, yes, shout outs to home. Um, and we too are a gathering place. And I think about when I learned about my ancestors and the work that they did in that area as conveners, as peacemakers, as traders, as hosts, hosts of many nations that made me proud. And I think about the work that I'm doing now and I think about that moment right in the middle of I Don't Know More, I think, where I thought, I want to live up to the greatness of my ancestors. And I think that's when I started my journey towards the work that I'm doing now with the 4 Hours Youth Movement. And that's when I started the conversation with myself and I started the conversation with others around this idea of reconciliation and this idea of us as young people, what is it that we can do to help? What is it that we can do to acknowledge the healing journey of the survivors and their families? knowing that there are many people that are part of this movement, but that we want to be a movement upon movements upon movements. And I sit here and I'm joined by many people who are doing that. So, Wob did a really good job at uh, doing the uh, introduction of exactly what 4Rs is. But when I reflect on who we are and what we are, I think about relationships. We're 14 national organizations, and although that might not be innovative, it certainly is precedented, especially having five national Aboriginal organizations on the table to say that we want to support young people to be having this conversation and having this dialogue. And I'm really happy to be seeing some of our partners here in the audience today. We have the Friendship Centers here and, and a part of this great gathering, the Innovation Summit. Um, I see Scott Haldane in the audience over there from YMCA Canada, one of our other partners. And of course, having the support of funders 
who not only bring money to the table, but they bring support in terms of their thinking and their staff. And I see Stephen Hutter here, and I'd like to acknowledge the support from the McConnell Foundation, and Andrea Nempton here from In Spirit Foundation, and I think, oh, and Gwen too. Hey, Gwen, how's it going? Um, so knowing that the work that we do requires a lot of people and a lot of voices at the table. So what is innovative about what we're doing? is that I think that we're creating our own kind of gathering spaces, a new way to look at how can we can gather as young people. And when people say to me, well, what's innovative about what you do? It's kind of funny because I say, well, we're bringing people together for face-to-face -to -face dialogue. Seems funny, but we do not do that enough. We do not spend time to have tea with one another. We do not spend time to ask each other how we are, who we are, and what we need. And when I think about where we want to go as a country and where we want to go as young people in the country that we want to have an impact on, I think we need to know each other as people in order to do that together. And that's what I think that we're trying to do. So our process in itself is the most important thing because we are centering Indigenous knowledge in the way that we're holding these conversations. Taking care to know the people who we're inviting and taking care to make sure that those invitations come from a place of love and a light place of care. And when I think about this, I think about, well, what does this mean for me as an individual and how am I contributing to the reconciliation? And a quote comes to mind from um, a member of our steering committee. And she says, shit damn, this world ain't so nice, now what? And it's true. And I feel it every day because I am for the first time without a clue what it is that I need to do this work. There are no tools in my tool belt to know how to reconcile. There's no books that I can read that can tell me the step-by-step -step of what I need to do. And this is the most challenging professional and personal journey that I've ever had in my life. And I am angry because I'm starting to learn about what has happened to my ancestors and what is happening to my people and actually the future that is potential for my nieces and my nephews. And I'm frustrated because not only am I dealing with the weight of the history that exists in this country, I'm also dealing with the fact that I am trying to decolonize my own way of being. And I'm trying to find a way to go forward with truth from my heart and to guide myself in that way. But among the frustration and the anger, there is so much love. And that's what I want to focus on because when people talk about, you know, what are you grateful for today? I always say, I love the people that I get to work with. I love them so much because they have my back. And there's a group of them that are here in this audience right now. And I love you and I thank you and I'm so grateful for you for having my back. And so, What's next for us for 4Rs? We're convening conversations across the country. We're bringing together Indigenous and non-Indigenous young people in content and in format that is relevant to young people. And now we're looking to scale. But we're looking to scale with care. So we've been practicing these conversations and we're now thinking and reflecting with each other about what is it going to mean for us to do this work for the long term? So for me, what can I do for reconciliation? Part of it is to continue the conversation. But part of it is to do the work that I need to do for myself so that I can make sure that this work is not only a short-term thing that ends at, a, at the duration of a contract, but it's something that I'm committing to for the rest of my life. And for that, I need to make sure that I take care of myself. And so we were asked to, look, to say, what is it that we can be doing as people? 
What is it we can be doing as people in this audience? And so I, I would like to invite you as well to create your own gathering spaces at your kitchen tables, in your boardrooms, in your classrooms, on the street. And think about the ways that you can be continuing this conversation so that the work of the TRC doesn't end in six months, that that conversation continues to move forward. And I always think that other, other people's words are much more better than mine, so I'd like to end with a quote from a dear friend of mine. His name is Mitch Case, and he's um, a young Métis man from Sault Ste. Marie. And he said that reconciliation may never happen but the possibility is worth trying. So let's make that possible. Miigwech. Oh, miigwech, Jessica. So at this time, uh, we're going to invite somebody up who's, uh, you know, a great uh, figure in our community in her own right but uh, also played a strong role behind the scenes in forging one of the most powerful moments uh, of this whole uh, journey that we witnessed in the TRC. And to me, that was uh, you know, a few years back when 70,000 people showed up in Vancouver to march uh, and show their solidarity and support for the residential school survivors and uh, to demonstrate their commitment to reconciliation. Right? 70,000 people, it's remarkable. And of course, they were responding to the, the call made by the commissioners of the TRC, but it was due to the outreach and the hard work, the behind the scenes machinations of uh, Reconciliation Canada that uh, those uh, masses of people showed up and uh, demonstrated their resolve to see reconciliation happen in their country within their lifetime. So at this time, I'd like to invite up the uh, executive director of Reconciliation Canada, Karen Joseph. Hakela Kasla Nasdamuyu Nugwa Am Kunwetagilish. I thank you, Elder Kelly, for starting this time together in a sacred way for sharing the medicines and the teachings that, that have been handed down to you from generation to generation. Reconciliation, as Justice Sinclair mentioned, is a big word. It's a complicated word, just as innovation is. And for us to achieve those things together requires deep thought and, and deep contemplation about what does that mean and how do we move forward. I shared with you my traditional name, Kunwatagilich. It means thunder in the house. I'm the eldest daughter of a hereditary chief named Kunkun Kuligeti who is known as Big Thunderbird within our communities and who has a level of leadership throughout my life that I've rarely seen in many people. Where we walk sometimes one way in public and another way at home. And he's a man who's able to traverse a great number of spaces with his integrity intact and to, and to do that in a way that is inspirational and aspirational. Two, if you look up those words, are sub-definitions of innovation. Like Stephen, I'm an introvert by nature. And I'm a woman. And so sometimes people look at me because I don't have those warm, fuzzy 
things that some women have, and I and I don't uh, I don't laugh and be gregarious and. And my daughter helps get me dressed in the morning because she worries about style and all of those kinds of things. <laughs> and part of my own journey of reconciliation has been accepting that that's my truth, that that's who I am, and that I can stand and I can be in my own strength without trying to be something different than I am. And I'm a daughter of that hereditary chief. And I have unique skills. I'm an educated woman. I'm a woman of privilege. First, he is my father. Second, I am educated. Third, I was raised predominantly off reserve. Although I'm a First Nations woman. And that man has watched me go through a journey in my life of tribulation, of struggle, and of trying to achieve some aspirations. And I was at a moment in my life where I couldn't see myself moving forward any longer. Many of you may or may not know that uh, based on where you've heard me. But I'm, as I mentioned, an introvert by nature, and my safe space was always school. And I had a dream when I was a young person to be a physician. And that was the thing that carried me through all of those deaths, all of those struggles, all of those trials that we go through as Indigenous people from a young age. And I did well. I made it all the way to medical school. And I'm an intergenerational survivor. Both of my parents went for many years to residential school. And so I grew up in that dangerous place, in that violent place, in that unsafe place. And I experienced all of the things that you hear about, that you read about. And when I went into that medical school, one of the trials that I had to deal with was anatomy lab. And I'm a survivor of sexual abuse, of, as the judge put it when we w went through court, some of the most horrific abuse that he's heard of in his, his lifetime on, on, the, on the trail. And when I went into that anatomy lab, I couldn't handle the fact that we were handling bodies when they had no control and they had no say and we were, in a sense, violating them by doing the things that we needed to do in school. And so it triggered what was called, what's called PTSD for me. And that ultimately resulted in almost every organ in my body shutting down and me requiring 10 different surgeries in order to overcome that. And ultimately, my dream of medical school was lost as a result of that. And so I was broken, and my dad knew this. And he came to me and he said, Karen, He let, me, he let me live in this little community for a year by myself, restoring a boat that had no business being restored. But he let me go there and, and recuperate and recover from all that I had lost. And then one day he came to me and he said, Karen, I need your help. I want you to come and help me work on this reconciliation, facilitate this dialogue workshop. I know you can do that. I know you can facilitate a dialogue workshop. And I see my cousin back there going, you can't say no to my dad. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll do this. And in that dialogue workshop, I thought I had no life left. Everything that I was, everything that I had worked for, every, I had done all the right things. And the final straw for me in school 
while I was going through those anatomy labs and while I was struggling with those things was finding out that my aunt was one of the murdered and missing Indigenous women, and specifically with the Robert Picton incident. And I remember that day crumpling to the ground and saying, I can't do this anymore. I can't get back up again. And so I was broken in that way, my spirit. And he said, it's time now. Let's go and do this. You can do this little thing. And when I was there, he started asking me to do more and more. And very few people know that at that time, he was the uh, executive director of the Indian Residential School Survivor Society. His name is Chief Dr. Robert Joseph. And he's been working on this file from the very, very beginning, the Indian Residential School file. And he said to me, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was coming to town, he said, Karen, we need to support them. We need to make this the biggest event and let the people know reconciliation is not an Indigenous issue. It's a Canadian issue. It's a Canadian story. And Canadians need to be involved if we're ever going to create a better future for us moving forward. So let's pull together all of these people and make this happen. I want this walk to happen. And he was... And so like, what, what was I going to say to him? No. <laughs> I was in a program with some friends. And in those friends, one of the people that I met was a woman who is of Jewish descent. And uh, her brother was Daniel Pearl. And if uh, you've ever seen the movie uh, A Mighty Heart, you know who I'm talking about. He was one of the journalists that was beheaded. Um, and we talked about our cultural differences as people who were intergenerational survivors of genocide. And although our communities coped uniquely differently with those, those genocides that we experienced, the messages we told ourselves were the same. And that's when I started recognizing, I said to her, but your people are so good at these things. And our people are really good at circles, creating sacred space, at sharing our love, sharing our, our, our deep spirits with one another. And her people are really good at family and all of those other things as well, but they're really good with finances. And if you know anything about my family anyway, we're, we're terrible at those kinds of things. So I'm, I'm a daughter of a hereditary chief. We give it all away. I said, wouldn't that be neat if we could weave together those strengths? Wouldn't that be neat if we brought together people from Jewish descent, people from First Nations or Indigenous descents, people from the Japanese internments, people from the Chinese head tax, people from the, the Sikh community, all of those people that have received an official apologies and start talking about what does reconciliation mean? Start talking about how do we weave together those unique resiliences that we've built as a result of those experiences. So it wasn't about talking about my horror was worse than your horror or, or any of those things. It's talking, you know, the one thing that we always talk about, has anybody ever heard that pan story? The, the, the ham story? Okay, I'm, I'm, not gonna I'm not gonna share it with you, but you look it up one day. But what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, because I'm worried about time. But how many of you, when you were growing up, said, I'm never gonna be like my parents? And then there you are with your children and all that same stuff comes out, right? We learn what we learn, what we learn, what we learn. It's handed down whether or not we want to acknowledge that those things are there. And so are our resiliences. And reconciliation for us was about weaving together those resiliences so that we could create a future that we couldn't even imagine alone. And for me, that was the important part of it. And my father was the one that 
kept guiding us through it. Every time we lose faith, every time we lose the mission, every time we, we get angry or we get frustrated, he always says to us, stay the course. Stay the course. Reconciliation is about namuyu. We are all one. We all are here together. And we all have an impact on one another. And we all have to come to this place in a sacred way so that when we talk about reconciliation, when we talk about those shared histories, when we talk about our stories, it's important to talk about our stories because our stories define how we show up today. Why do I believe the things I believe? Why do I do the things that I do? It's because of those histories that I, that I come with you today. And so we can't create understanding doesn't mean, as we heard earlier, that we need to agree with one another. But we have to start learning to try to understand one another, to have open hearts, to have open minds, to have open spirits, so that we can innovate, we can inspire, we can aspire to something that we can't do alone. And that's what reconciliation is about. And there was, a, there was a environic study that said two-thirds of Canadians saw themselves playing a role in reconciliation even though they had nothing to do with the residential schools. Two-thirds of Canadians. We as Indigenous people had never held our hand out and said, come and join us on this journey. We had never said, we need you. And so that's what we did at that Walk for Reconciliation. We reached out to all of those groups saying, we need you if we're going to transform this country moving forward. And the people came. The people came. We had 70,000 people that came that day. And it was the pouring rain like it can only snow here, it can only rain there. <laughs> and we anticipate, based on our volunteer attrition rates, that we would have had over 200,000 people come to join us that day to say, we want a new way forward in this Canada. We want a way forward that's based on a value of reconciliation. Reconciliation is not an action. It's a way of life. It's a way of being. And so when we, as Justice Sinclair and all of our other speakers have said, once you embark on that journey, you can't turn back. It's about nakalkala, peace within. And when you live from that pace of peace, you can't help but draw in those people. You can't help but get re-energized every day. And that's the journey that we're inviting you to go on. We're moving across the country as Reconciliation Canada. We've got plans for the next five cities, five more cities to bring about these kinds of change. And as they said, it starts with each of you. The very first act of reconciliation, and this is, I'll close with this, that I ever experienced in my life was when my mother left us. <clears throat> and we were, this was back a time ago. And uh, a time when parent, fathers never raise children. Only mothers raise children. And there my father was left with no mother in a house full of teenagers as a single man. And he came home one day and we're eating dinner and we're all sad. And it hadn't been too long that my mother had been away and we were hurting. All of us were hurting. And he said, sit down. We're going to have dinner together. And every one of us is going to share how we're doing today. Every one of us is going to share what are our hopes for on this day. And so there's all of us five kids. No idea how to do that. No idea how to have those conversations and we stumbled through it. And he's made some amazing leaders within his family now, as we're seeing here with the parents that are committed to reconciliation, 
and the impacts that their children are having on them and that they're having on their children. We, can, we too can pass that down to the next generation, this vision of reconciliation. So with that, I say thank you for your patience this evening. Thank you for joining us. And It was very powerful. Miigwech. You know, uh, the hereditary chief that she's speaking of, uh, I, I heard him speak here in Winnipeg, I think it was in 2011, at a conference on the intergenerational legacy of uh, residential schools. And um, he really put things into perspective for me in a way that I had never understood prior to that moment in my life. He said, and I felt like he was speaking to me as if I were the only person in the room. He said, you know, as a residential school survivor parent to a child of a residential school survivor, we always loved you. We just never knew how to show you. And you know, that came when I was almost 30 years old. Here my whole life, I always thought that my father hated me until I heard your father say those words. And I sat back and I thought, huh. So that's what it was all these years. But now I want to thank you because I see you now. And I hear what you say. And it's a remarkable thing to watch your journey and to watch the example that you set before us tonight on how reconciliation is an act, a way of life, of social innovation because now it's on us it's on our generation it's on the generation that comes after us to do the hard work in our hearts to peel back those layers of our personality which have been forged by the dysfunction which was wrought on our communities through the residential school era and in so doing I think that we can reappropriate this process of reconciliation towards answering uh, some of the great questions of our time. It seems to me that a people, that peoples who know that the earth is their mother might have some idea of how to answer the challenge of climate change. It seems to me that peoples who judge wealth not by how much you accumulate, but by how much you give away, may have some ideas about how to respond to the challenge of income inequality. And it seems to me that peoples who were warriors, who even in the heat of battle still found ways to recognize the humanity of their enemies, may have something to say about the global war on terror. And what's more, people who welcome newcomers, who had that trust in the newcomer betrayed, and yet still to this day extend the olive branch to those newcomers while they may have a thing or two to say about how to greet and welcome and respond to the refugee crisis currently at uh, play in this world. But that's just the beginning, as far as I can tell. As far as I can tell, all of those issues are manifestations of a deeper underlying challenge faced by our society today. And that is that for too many of us in the modern world, there is an existential nothingness at the center of our existence that drives us to consumerism, that drives us to turn inward and ignore the humanity of our neighbors that drives us to latch on to the divisions between peoples, communities, cultures, and nations. And so when I hear you, Karen, speak, when I hear Stephen, Jessica, Rye, and Murray speak of their vision to reconciliation, I recognize that this journey perhaps offers salvation from that existential abyss. That in working together to repair the damage in our hearts, that in learning to build compassion for the residential school survivor sharing their story, to have the patience 
with the ally whose heart in the right place but still may offend us with their lack of cultural understanding. That on the flip side, that the person on the other side of that relationship, in learning about indigenous peoples, in learning about the humanity which was preserved even in the midst of the inhumane, might begin to understand those universal values that my uncle referred to as the seven grandfather teachings, that our languages know as Kijewatiziwen, and then we maganitok, metakiyayasin, or the fact that we're all related. So I'm optimistic. I am hopeful. I know that this journey of reconciliation perhaps started out of a quest for social justice, to do right by the residential school survivors. But when I hear words like those shared by these esteemed panelists tonight, I know that it can do so much more. It can also be the process which delivers us closer to understanding what we're doing here, how we ought to relate to one another, and what this whole thing means. So please join me one more time in extending a sincere, sincere round of applause and tons of gratitude to all of these great people up here. Miigwech. And so they wanted to have a, an honor song for, for Murray Sinclair. But in light of, uh, I think, what um, Stephen was saying about recognizing the other commissioners and the other people here, maybe we'll just change that up a little bit. So maybe if I could ask Murray to stand in the middle, and we can uh, honor, honor Murray. And if we can have uh, Stephen stand beside him, standing in for Murray, but also <laughs> Don't fall, please. You know, but also representing the residential school survivors. If we could have Karen up here on the right as the, the stand-in for the children of the residential school survivors. If we could have Rye up here as the uh, bearer of the torch, carrying on the work of the TRC. And then if we could have Jessica up as the young person, as the son, as the daughter, who all this is being invested in. And then maybe we can all join together and honor all of them together in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
To close us off in a ceremonial way, I'll invite Nemishu uh, Me, my uncle Kije Baose Makwa, Fred Kelly, up uh, one more time to uh, give us uh, some closing words. Omage ni wavi to go te go go igir. Ke se ni wavi to ka mixing go ya ke ke in shoy shkaves. Anishna ge mi go ji agir mane to sa kif kif vesen doy. Kif vesen don ge gi don so mage ke jayan. E na chimoin. E jaga ka fi jaga usata sings. Before I say good night to you the wonderful speakers and the wonderful messages of these people. We are fortunate and we have to recognize that the Creator is very kind. From time to time, we receive these beautiful people amongst, our, amongst ourselves, and I include all of you in the audience. We do not recognize at times that you are gifts to us share in the spirit of reconciliation. In my language, I'm often called upon to give some translations, such as genocide. People had said that we have no word for that, and yes, there is. I'm going to eat even to exterminate someone or exterminate beings. But it doesn't have to mean total extermination, the attempt in itself. Also, Reconciliation. What is the concept in our language? The only concept I can think of is shawainim. Love that person. But when I say love, I don't mean that in a mushy way. I mean that invoking all of those seven grandfather teachings and those that mean. And so I share with you one thing with you. In closing, about reconciliation. As Stephen said, and as many of these people, I admire these people. There were times when I have had to take out the pipe and offer my invocations for the strength and courage of Murray Sinclair and the commissioners, who day after day would hear all these sad stories. Where do they put them without collapsing? I know that Murray has some setbacks health-wise, and that's when I picked up the pipe in my own way that he would get that strength and he would get that courage and have that resilience to come back and carry on. And so when we listen to these people speaking about the experiences that they went through in this uh, TRC, there were also people in the background that were working very hard, such as some of these people, and they continue to work. I want to acknowledge with you some other people that whose names rarely get mentioned, and I want to take the opportunity right now. Anne McLellan, who was a Minister of Justice, who had to sign off on the Orders and Council starting this uh, Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, negotiations towards it. Frankie Iacovucci, former Supreme Court, Justice, who chaired and represented Canada on that. The Honorable Kotler, who was sat in sanctioning. And then we brought this over to the sacred roundhouse to consecrate the mandate of Frankie Iacobucci because I knew that there would be times when he would be challenged. And yes, indeed, when you are negotiating with 
at times, 80 lawyers who, in my view at times, represented not the interests of the victims and the survivors, but rather their personal financial interests, was rather difficult at times. And yet, Frank Iacovucci sat there, sometimes being insulted, and he was discouraged, and I had to remind him, you remember what, what we said at that residential school, or at that consecration of your mandate? I told you then, in front of the sacred, round, in the sacred round house, in front of the Creator, in front of the spirits, and I had to remind him. This is not about Frank Iacovucci. This is not about the lawyers. This is not about Canada. This is not about anybody else but the individual school survivor who had no say as to whether they would be attending a residential school, but rather were forced into it, just like I was. And so, would you please come back after he had walked out of the negotiations? And he did come back, and we had to finally complete that. So, and then on our side, the people who were there marginalized by the other lawyers because we did not have a class action suit. And that was Phil Fontaine, who led this, and Kathleen Mahoney, their chief negotiator. And then there was Bob Watts, who at the time was the CEO of the uh, Assembly of First Nations, and myself and some other people. This was the core of those negotiators who saw through to see this Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. And then capable people that were appointed but spun their wheels and finally had to be replaced by the more capable persons such as Murray Sinclair and his co-commissioners on that. So these are the people that made this possible. But there's other aspects of reconciliation that we need to take in mind and keep in mind. And my late brother, who was inspired after his visit to Rome and to go visit the Pope, who suggested to me, as well as Phil Fontaine, as well as Bert Fontaine, who we had adopted each other as brothers, and we adopted Archbishop James Weisgerber, the Archbishop of the, of the St. Boniface Diocese, under which St. Mary's and Fort Alec were. He is our true brother. We didn't do this out of show. We didn't do this out of, we did it out of sincerity. And he is a true brother. And so those are the kinds of things that we felt that we had to do to show because up to this point, I hated everybody. Anything that resembled the Catholic Church, I hated, including the nuns and the priests and the memories and the whole legacy. And I had to deal with that in terms of reconciliation. And so I share with you this one final point and that is this. To me, it was about attitude. Because how many times have I been told by people, use your brain. Well, how do you use your brain? Well, I don't know how to use the brain. But what happens is when you react to the emotional challenges of what happened to you, you begin to hate and you memories that a legacy of those memories, then you hate and all those things creep up into you. That's because your brain is reacting to those emotions, that your neural circuitry and those neurons that re make you react in a hateful way. Now, if you use your brain, you change that. You think, you think, and there's another way of doing that. In other words, up to that point, your brain is using you. You're not using your brain. It's your attitude then that changes when you start to use your brain. I share that with you because that's what I've had to do and also. And then I also had to acknowledge many of my own things and I still am not in that position of where I can say I totally forgive myself or forgive all those people, but I am working on it. So it's a lifelong process of reconciliation. My dear wife who took the brunt of my dysfunctional behavior, my alcoholism, my all of those aberrational behaviors. She stuck with me. For 47 years we were married until she passed away in 2008. She taught me how to live. She taught me how to die. I thank all the ladies who stick with their partners despite all those challenges that they also had to face. And when I went to the adjudicator for the independent assessment process, which was a modified alternate dispute resolution. 
I brought my boys because they had to hear what I had to say and I had to apologize to them and sincerely for them to hear this, the brunt that they took as children. Those are the intergenerational things and I'm glad that they were there with me. So I share these things with you, not to regurgitate all the hatred that I have, but rather to tell you that I have made peace with myself, I've made peace with their memories, and I've made peace with as many people as I can because my mission is to be kind, patient, humble, and compassionate. And even though I am alone, I live alone now, I now have solitude in my serenity. And I am serene in my solemn solitude. Those are the things that we still can have. And I thank the people, the panel who were here to give us their inspirational messages one by one. And I know there's more to it than the stories that we've just heard. We just had a little tip which had a peek in some of those things that have happened. And you also have your own issues that you will deal with. And I pray and as I close with this invocation, that I thank you very much for your kindness, for your love of being here to show your support, not only show your support, but also to gain for yourself what reconciliation really means. Because as Stephen said, it starts with you, starts with the individual, and it's a process. So I pray for each and every one of you, those of you whose parents may not be feeling well. Those of you whose partners are not feeling well. Those of you with family members who are not feeling well. Those of you with children who are not feeling well. I pray that they will be well. And I pray that you will have the fortitude and the forbearance to, to move forward because all is not lost. What you have heard here is the message of hope. And I also want to thank Wob for his excellent work. Let's give him a round of applause for the wonderful work that he's done. And and also, this is not a paid uh, advertisement, but by his book called You're the Reason That I Walk. But I'll be glad, uh, I'll have my hand in the back over here for some payment. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank each one of the, uh, and I thank each and every one of you. And lastly, but not certainly, not the least, but I want to thank the vision of the National Association of Friendship Centers for putting on such an event as we have had. Thank you.